Hey everybody, Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host of the Break It Down Show. Today's guest is returning Dr. Will Riley, who wrote a book, Taboo, 10 Facts You Can't Talk About. And in Will's book, he really does get into taboo topics. He challenges our thoughts on race relations, on Black Lives Matter. He challenges beliefs on cultural appropriation, IQ validity, all of these different things that you can't normally talk about. He does, and he delivers the numbers, and I love this book. It's just something that needed to happen a long time ago. Let me give you a little taste. One of the things he talks about is if you took the number of deaths, it's not assault rifles that matter. It's handguns, black dudes killing black dudes. I can't talk about that. I'm not a black dude, but he can. He's a PhD. He's a political scientist. Oh, by the way, and a black dude who teaches at a traditionally black university. So he takes the numbers and says, here's where the real problem is. If we actually give a damn, this is the conversation we have to have, but we can't even have the conversation. So how on earth are we ever going to solve this problem? I love what Will does. I love how he pushes the norms and provides evidence to say, hey, you think you know about this? You don't. I was lucky enough to write a blurb for his book. And the thing I kept saying was he kept unseating me from my norm. He forced me to deal with the fact that I didn't know enough about what I thought I knew a lot about. And I love that about Will. I love that about this chat. And you're going to love Will also. Hey, a couple things real quick before we get started. It's great if you help support the show. So obviously you can go buy t-shirts. But just in general, share the show. Tell your friends about it. Uh, Engage with me. I'm glad to talk to you. You guys are my friends. I want to hear from you. No matter what country you're in, I love it. I love that you're in Macedonia, Spain, France, Germany, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. Hey, cat. I love you guys. I love hanging out and talking and, and throwing these shows out there. Give me your ideas. Buy the shirts. Share the show. That's how you help. One more thing, and you know what I'm going to say next. Save the Brave. Save the Brave.org. Go to the Donate tab. Click on Donate. Click on a monthly amount. If you'd buy a veteran a lunch once a month, that's what we're talking. $25. Do that. We'll take that money. We'll put it to work, and we'll actually save veteran lives, veterans that have PTSD. If you want to understand it, let me know. I will tell you. Scott and I will do a whole thing about Save the Brave, and we will explain what we do and how we help change these veterans' lives and get them going in the right direction. And guess what happens after that? They just bring it back, and they start to serve and give back even more. This is a worthy cause. Please support Save the Brave. All right, Dr. Will Riley. Here he comes. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitchell Gillespie. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, how are you? This is Dr. Will Riley. You're listening to The Break It Down Show with Pete Turner. Yes, Will Riley is uh, fascinating. He... Look, he wrote a book called Taboo. I was proud to write a blurb for it. And it's one of those books that it unseats you from your beliefs in a way that is not very fun. Um, I guess I'll let you introduce the book, Will, because it's a, I've been waiting for someone to write this. Um, if I was to write a book, that would not be the first book I picked. I'm so stoked that you did because this this message needed to get out there. Yeah. So in terms of the book, first, I was going to open by saying Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself, <laughs> but I've done that a few times already, and I want to be original for you, Pete. Thank you. So that that's, a, you know, neither here nor there. Uh, in terms of the book, Taboo, Taboo, as the name indicates, is a book that looks at kind of the things that you're not supposed to discuss in society. Mm. So there are a few of these. I mean, the first chapter looks at the claims of the Black Lives Matter movement that we've got a near race war going on in the United States. Um, Thousands or at least hundreds of unarmed black men are killed annually by Leos, by law enforcement officers. What I find is that there's really no element of truth to that. Uh, In a typical year, the number of unarmed black men shot specifically by white cops is about 15, uh, sometimes 20. Uh, 70% of the individuals shot by law enforcement officers happen to be Caucasian, whites or Hispanics. The groups most likely to be shot by police are poor whites or recent legal immigrants. So I unpack this and then, and I think I might make this part a separate book at some point, I go through about five of the Black Lives Matter cases and look at what actually happened. Um, The Alton Sterling situation, for example, where the guy happened to be an accused sex offender 
The police had arrived because of a report of him brandishing a gun at someone else. Physical fight between him and the police. As I recall this, when the gun falls off his belt, unfortunately, he gets shot. That was a fairly typical case. So chapter one looks at Black Lives Matter. Chapter two looks at the claim that there is epidemic interracial crime in the USA, especially from whites in general. So I break down the actual figures on interracial violence. And one of the things I generally say about this is the person most likely to kill you is your ex-husband or ex-wife. That's still the case. Um, in terms of interracial crime, even against whites, black people make up 13.7% of the country, commit 15.3% of the violent crimes against whites, so there's no war. But on the other end of the dial, um, this is even more notable in reverse. Whites commit about 11% of all crimes against blacks maximum. Uh, white criminals choose black victims about 3% of the time. So I'm kind of being wonky with the numbers here, but this is presented in an interesting fashion. And the point is just this is not happening, especially from the white side. There's a chapter on race and IQ. There's a chapter on problems with the alt-right. There's a chapter on cultural appropriation and white privilege, which are things I don't really think exist. I mean, cultural appropriation would require me to take off my suit jacket from Britain and not go to a Japanese restaurant with my girlfriend tonight if we were going we're gonna to take this seriously. Um, so it's just all of the things that you're kind of not supposed to say in modern, you know, quote unquote, upper middle class discourse that I kind of run through. And I ask, is this true? A uh, very few of them I find some support for, but most, no, no epidemic of interracial crime. Don't find much evidence of white privilege. The cops aren't out there just murdering men. So on down the line. One chapter I want to squeeze in there as we go into final edits is essentially, can men be women? You know, you have the the trans movement very active right now. And the claim is that gender is just sort of a social construct. I think there's a lot of evidence that it's not, that if you took me or Pete and you let us work out for a couple of weeks and put us in a ball gown, we would not necessarily behave on par with women when it comes to aggression, verbal IQ, a whole bunch of other things. But anyway, so that's taboo, all the stuff you're not supposed to say. Hey, this is Pete A. Turner from the Break It Down Show, checking in real quick to ask you this. John, Scott, and I all support Save the Brave with our time, our location, our effort, and our money. Each month, we give a small amount. Do the same with us. Go to savethebrave.org, click on the Donate tab, pick an amount that you want to come out each month, and they will handle all the rest. I stand behind these folks. Thank you so much. Let's get back to the show. But anyway, so that's taboo, all the stuff you're not supposed to say. Yeah. So it, it's things and all these topics, you have your own established belief and maybe it moves a little bit, but I, I would say, and this is obviously just a guess, but once okay. you sort of get set in your mindset of, of, of where the race violence is, you're not moving very far. You know, it's unlikely that you're going to move, I don't know, 30 degrees left or right on the topic because it's just, it's hard to challenge your own belief on these things and everything's so questionable, but you're really grabbing actual numbers on. Uh, I remember when we were doing stuff with the, uh, the advanced fee, the advanced peace folks, it's a Devon Bogan's program. Basically he case manages the most violent people in a town like Sacramento or Richmond. And he just, he works them. He just gives them someone who believes in them and they get them to stop being by and large, stop being violent criminals. Um, mm -hmm. And then that was right around the time when the Black Lives Things Matter. But what is it? I guess my question to you is this. If you go into a store and you rob somebody, you've committed a crime. Okay. Yeah. External social things aside, you can't go rob people. And then if you go and you reach into a car and you grab after a cop's gun, it's a justifiable harm. You're trying to attack a cop and go after his gun. This is a life. I mean, I'm a combat guy, so you know, I always think like that's a life or death struggle, and you know, I don't know when you're going to stop, so you're going to get shot. Yep. Well, I have a lot of respect for police officers for that reason because they're in kind of that gray zone between the combat soldier and the tough civilian. Yeah. I mean, I've talked about these exact situations. I mean, you're describing Michael Brown specifically, right? Um, I go to the gun range once or twice a week just to keep my skills up. And I mean, we've had this conversation. I mean, what would you do if you're an officer Darren Wilson situation? And everyone there, as it happened, we had this conversation, was either just a tough, regular guy, and tough in quotes, but a good right. a mighty man, a shooter, or someone who was, say, a National Guardsman, a former Marine, something like that. There were no cops that day. And everyone, to a man, said, I would just shoot him. Yeah. If someone reached into my car and they were attempting to grab my firearm and they had their hand on the front of my chest and I didn't know this person, I would just shoot them. Yeah. There was no dissenting voice. 
What made that so difficult in the case of a police officer, I think, is that you are trained to such an extent that you're not a member of an occupying army. And you're also not just some guy in a fight with another guy who can do what's necessary to defend your wife. Right. You're expected to go through, it's essentially like ROE for combat engagements, but every step but the last is non-lethal. You yeah. know, attempt to engage in conversation, attempt to disengage, attempt to bring in backup units, attempt to use the non-lethal. So, yeah, cops have a tough job. Um, and what we found when we looked at the Black Lives Matter cases, myself and Jane Lingle, my saintly research associate, is that most of them fell into this kind of unsympathetic zone. By okay. that, I mean, it's not that the cops never made any mistakes, uh, in the case of Freddie Gray, for example, one allegation was that they gave him a quote unquote rough ride, i.e. there'd been a tough pursuit when the police had encountered Mr. Gray, he'd run away. There'd been a bit of a scuffle when he was captured. They were probably angry. So they put him in the back of a police van, allegedly, and kind of drove around roughly for a while. And that and a pre-existing injury might have contributed to the spinal injury that he suffered. So no one is saying that the police behaved perfectly in all these situations. But what you almost never find is a black man or a white man, for that matter, being unprovokedly slaughtered on the way to church. Pretty much every case was what you're describing. There's some kind of altercation between the guy and the officers. Weapons are usually drawn and the police respond with violence. And there's much, much more scrutiny on that violence than there would be if you or I did it or if someone did it in a combat zone overseas. That that really just can't be denied. But just one quick comment, then I want to engage your responses. But I mean, the Alton Sterling case keeps sticking in mind. So, I mean, Alton Sterling is one of those guys. This throughout the South was kind of the the Trayvon Martin, the Michael Brown. Um, this was a Louisiana man who's often described as having been gunned down in broad daylight by the police. Mm. And if you actually look through that case, which I do for about five pages of Taboo, what happened was that a local shopkeeper called the police and reported a man brandishing a gun in the street. Um, and the guy wasn't just out there. He happened to be running a bootleg CD business. So he had accounts vary, but either books full of hundreds of bootleg movies and CDs or an actual stand full of these illegal products. Right. So the cops show up and they find this bootlegger. And if they run his name through any kind of dashboard computer, I don't know exactly whether they did or not. They would have also found that he was a convicted pedophile. Uh, he'd been convicted on at least one occasion of sexual knowledge of a minor child. Um, pretty easy to find. I found that in about 10 minutes. I can't imagine the police didn't. So you're approaching this guy who, you know, has these pretty disturbing convictions, who's got a gun on him. A scuffle breaks out. Sterling apparently reaches for the gun and he's shot. Right. And the presentation for this in sort of the Black Lives Matter ecosphere was another innocent brother killed. I think virtually everyone who's familiar with the case, whether or not you think the cops made some mistakes by not saying, freeze, drop your weapon, whatever, um, understands why that happened. And that's most of the cases. Not perfect police behavior, but not Boy Scouts either. Yeah, I'm writing down notes so that I don't lose track of some of the things I want to ask you about because this stuff is, yeah. is is tricky. First off, let's openly acknowledge, and we've had Fred Leland on the show a number of times. We talk about this. We always, as a default, as a society, we seem to say, well, they just need more training. But the reality, Will, is this. Um, the person in charge of training at fill-in-the-blank police station doesn't, yeah. It's not like, what am I going to do with all this extra surplus time and money that I have? I just, I just can't give out enough of this training. We know that that's not true. You know, there's, yeah. there's actual, and then here's the, here's how long the line is of people saying, I would like to spend twice as much on my police force to ensure that we have a higher level of training because you know a third of our police force will have to be in training at all times, developing capacity, maintaining capacity, and searching for new capacity. You know, like. Yeah. Nobody's in that line. So yeah. you sort of, you like Sergeant Major always says, you got what you got. These are your cops. And some are going to be shitheads and some are going to be officer, you know, nice guy, and they're going to be great. But to expect something significantly more for the cost we're already paying, it ain't happening, brother. Yeah, I'd say that's, I'd say that's mostly correct. I mean, also, 
Obviously, I think, Pete, I think you and I can agree that you never want an innocent person to die or of these course. sort of cliches. We'd all like to live forever. Everyone's grandmother deserves a beautiful flower garden. I'm not attempting to make fun of anything here, but there is an idea of an ideal society that most people have. Yeah. But I mean, in real life, the reality is that utopia is literally the Latin word for no place. That's right. You generally, you generally do have, as you said, what you have. And it's striking how free, how rarely extreme police violence happens, yes. in all honesty. Yes. I mean, if you go to a resource, and this isn't me as, you know, chubby center-right political pundit saying this. If you go to www.killedbypolice.net, or you go to the Washington Post, the Counted Project. There's a list of everyone who dies in confrontation with the police in a typical year. And what you'll find is, I mean, you said there are 15 million to 20 million individual police patrols a year. I'd imagine each one of those involves four to six stops. So out of that 100 million data set of cases, there are about a thousand police shootings in a typical year. Yeah. Um, the number in, let's say, the representative year of 2015 that involve African-Americans at all was 258. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so we're about, we're usually about 25 to 30%. Right. And that, that reflects crime rate. There is a slightly, but very definitely higher rate of crime in the black community, not stratospheric anymore, but it, it would make sense that if we're 14% of the country, we're 30% of the police encounters. You take that group of 258, you find that less than a hundred people, and I think this is all races actually, were shot while they were unarmed. About 17 of those are going to be white cops shooting black men specifically. So, I mean, this isn't something that happens a great deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're going to talk about problems in the police sphere, police officers are shot far more often than police officers shoot unarmed black men. Right. So one of the harsh realities of leadership is that sometimes you have to say that's an acceptable level of risk. The typical police department in a typical year is going to have zero shootings of black males by officers, and it's going to have zero shootings of officers by black males. I'm in the Kentucky state capitol, which has no shortage of white and black males that'll fight you. And I mean, we have had none of either for, I could be wrong, but a six year period, seven year period. So to some extent, I mean, you're not going to double your entire police force's training budget to stop something that happens once every eight years. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, so the entire idea that this was a national problem was a spontaneously generated, if you will, idea. A specific activist movement, Black Lives Matter, grew up in response to a number of cases. And I think the leaders of that movement, if you look at Sean King or D. Ray McKesson, were smart guys who saw some potential there. Um, there is, I, I often say the demand for bigotry exceeds the supply. <laughs> um, there's a great demand for racial conflict to justify these massive programs, affirmative action and so forth. And there's not that much. So police violence seemed like new fertile ground. We're not saying it's ordinary white citizens fighting us anymore. Now it's the cops. But again, when people like you and I unpack that, we find, no, it's not. There, the number of people that fall into this category each year is 18. More people are killed by bees, wasps, and hornets. Yeah. And I, I want to uh, I want to take that point you made about utopia or utopia and, mm -hmm. and amplify it. This is a little bit old, but the guy the guy who tells this story in the story that Thomas Moore and Erasmus are, are telling, the the guy who tells the story is a guy named Hoffleday. And his his name literally means the purveyor of nonsense. So <laughs> I didn't know that. Like, yeah, it's great. And so you have this purveyor of nonsense talking about this perfect place because it's all just sort of this wrapped up thing. And so when people say utopia, I love it because, look, I fall victim to this, too. They don't know enough about what they're talking about to even know what they're talking about. You know, it, it's it doesn't work that way. Uh, I, I want to ask you this. And in part because you're you're the black guy in this conversation and I never can get a straight answer from someone from the black community on the record. So maybe you'll, and if you don't have to look, I'm not trying to put you in a spot and I don't think it's a hard question, but I do want to soften your, your requirement. 
Is there a responsibility culturally within the black community to learn how to engage a police officer in a positive way? I get that the system is negative and the perceptions are such that it's very hard to do that. But I got pulled over twice in the last, let's say, five months. One time driving over 90 miles an hour in Georgia, which apparently is is barely against the law. But, you know, I I had my hands high on the wheel. I didn't fish around for anything. I sat still. Anytime I was going to look, I'm a combat guy. I want to know where people's hands are. And so I said, I'm going to go to my, you know, my wallet, which is in my pocket. Do you mind if I grab that? And the guy's like, yeah, I don't, you know, and I, I am so concerned about their concern for their safety that, you know, I will let them grab my wallet. I, I don't want to get shot, you know, Fair but enough. that is not the case when I talk to, to black dudes, you know, they have a much more combative um, look. And I, I, I don't particularly care to have my freedom challenged by a police officer. I, I don't trust in general police officers. I know great police officers that I love, but I don't know who's walking up to that thing. And they're the one entity that can strip your freedom from you in an instant on based on their judgment. So I definitely don't like that, but I also respect the fact that they want to go home alive. Yeah. It's an interesting question. I mean, the short answer, I'll just answer the question. Yeah, I think obviously that as any adult citizen, especially an adult male, you have a duty to learn how to do basic things when it comes to engaging violence. And so, uh, like, and I don't, I guess the reason I hesitated, I don't necessarily think this is just a black thing. Oh, agreed, think, agreed, agreed. Yeah. I think we focus, because of where these activists chose to go, I think we focus more on confrontations with black men Again, the people most likely to get shot seem to be recent immigrants, poor whites, if you look at where police shootings are concentrated. And I would imagine that, quote unquote, hillbillies, the term that's disliked around here, or recent immigrants from Mexico or Italy have a lot of the same issues that African-Americans might. But I mean, for all those groups, when I was in Chicago, I was a teacher in the city colleges for a while, which is interesting if you want an in-city urban teaching experience, Malcolm X and Harry Truman and all of these schools. And I know that we offered courses on how to interact with the police and the justice system. Um, I taught primarily at Truman, but I would imagine these were at every one of the colleges. And it was basic stuff like don't show up to court in a white T-shirt and sweatpants. Yeah. And it's the same thing with police. And I mean, I didn't sit. In fact, I taught almost entirely at Truman when it comes to this sector. But anyway, that's that's not really relevant entirely. Um, But. Sorry, just thinking about my teaching experience, that's totally irrelevant. Anyway, basically, we did the same thing when it came to uh, interactions with the police. And if you ever set in on part of one of these classes, it's entertaining stuff to some extent. Chris Rock has a routine about this. Mm. But if you ask the typical urban young guy, whether that's African-American, Irish, Italian, Hispanic, whatever, how would you respond if a police officer comes to your window and you've been stopped for you think you've been stopped for no reason? The response initially is always something like, I would ask them why they were stopping me for no reason whatsoever. I mean, I've had enough of these punk ass police. And it's just sort of you would instruct people like, no, that's not what you would say. You know, Mr. Jenkins or Mr. McGillicuddy, even if you feel that you've been harassed to some slight extent. I mean, what you would say is, how can I help you? Do you need to see license and registration? So, yeah, I think that it is definitely very helpful. And this is something that high schools or junior colleges should cover to teach people how to interact with the police. And I have no doubt that when you get into young males in working class environments, and that certainly includes African Americans, you're gonna have a lot more dislike for or hostility toward the police than you would have on average. Right. So I don't think police are saints, but I don't think ordinary citizens are saints either. Mm. The more polite and logical you are when you're encountering some police duty patrol sergeant who's doing a 12 hour shift, the more likely both of you guys are to leave happy and with everything intact. So, yeah, I think that needs to be emphasized. I don't think anyone would even deny in normal conversation rather than in the politically correct world that working class African-American men are more likely to be rude to the police. So, yeah, the nicer you are to the police within reason, you're not going to let them give you a beating. But I mean, the nicer you are to the police within reason, the less likely you are to get in trouble. Yeah, I got pulled over twice. And, and you know, sure. middle aged white man who's invisible aside both times going a lot faster than I was supposed to be going, um, you know, because that just happens. It's L.A. We drive fast around here. 
Uh, neither yeah. time did I get a ticket, but that's partly because I said, you know what? I was going too fast. I'm sorry. I, one time I was in a rental car and I was like, I was just driving with the flow of traffic. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I know everybody goes fast and they let me go. Maybe I caught a benefit because of more, mostly because of my middle age, you know, the kindly old man nature, but for sure, by by respecting the fact that they want to go home alive, I, I definitely always attribute that to any time I deal with police and, and having them be a little bit, you know, more square with me. But let me ask you this, too. Again, black community, if, if we are really worried about young black men getting shot, you come from Chicago. You just talked about teaching there. Doesn't it behoove us as a society to, to focus you know, it's it's black men shooting black men. It's Mexicans shooting black men. It's people of color. It's young men of color. They're the ones who predominantly are dying from gunshot wounds. I've looked at the data. If you are if you are a, a female or a a person who's Asian or white and some and I'm using the big term Asian, not not just yeah. you know the the Far East folks. They're not shooting each other. It's it's yeah. Native Americans. Hispanic dudes, black dudes that are shooting each other. If we actually give a fuck at mm-hmm. all, aren't we aren't we bound to at least deal with the bigger problem, Will? Or or yes. is I mean, you're a you're a political scientist. Isn't that where the effort is? If we actually give a fuck, isn't that where we're supposed to put our effort? Yeah, there's a lot there. Um, I'm going to take some notes here. Italians, Irish, eighty five percent crime today. And then top 25. So first of all, I mean, I think that, and this, I don't think you're saying this, but I do think it's important to recognize that the contemporary level of violence among black and Hispanic men is an artifact of our era to some extent. I don't think that's a racial or genetic or anything along those lines. Right, It's not genetic for sure, right? Yeah. I had a a conversation recently with a guy who was kind of alt-light politically and who was asking well, can you imagine what Chicago would be like if it was all white? There'd be almost no crime. And I'm kind of a connoisseur of Chicago history. And I said, well, the last time Chicago was all white, <laughs> it was run by Al Capone's boys. Be careful I mean, on Valentine's mob. Day. Yeah, it was the mob. And tough. Yeah, Valentine's Day wasn't all that romantic those days. But I mean, it was you know, the mob, the Irish mob up north, the Boyle crew. Can I jump Mitch in for a second up. on you and say, because I love this. This is great. Over yeah. at, um, is it Union Station, the big station downtown? Yeah, Union Station. You can put your finger in the holes of the columns where there were gunfights. Yep. And then you can yeah, see the splash marks where they've patched them. And they just didn't pack. Ah, fuck it. There's too many bullets. You know, those shots, yeah, well, those are 45s. Those things probably came out of a Tommy gun, you know, during some yeah, kind of oh, crazy-ass firefight at the train station. Yeah, a lot of those mob guys were World War One veterans. So yeah. they knew how to use the Thompson machine gun, the Tommy gun. Which, yeah, I think that shoots, that's a machine gun that shoots a 45 slug. I mean, that's a hell of a weapon. Yes. That's the one you see in gangster movies that has the drum on it, right? Yeah. So, I mean, the crime rate for Italian and Irish American males through 1950 was probably pretty similar. I'd have to go city by city. I know Chicago's right. But to the crime rate for black and Hispanic males today. So that's not excusing the violence that's now a problem in my community that we need to solve. That, that's just a note. If You can't stack poor people who drink. You know, if you have large urban vertical slums, you're going to have a crime problem. Yeah. And if you brilliantly put those near downtown to provide access to jobs, you're going to have a Chicago level crime problem or Detroit level crime problem. Anyway, uh, so but that that is the history. Italians, Irishmen, so on did this in the past. But yeah, today there's no secret about where gunfire is primarily concentrated. And I think there is an attempt on the political left to disguise this to a pretty ridiculous degree. If you look at these statistics on gun violence from, say, every town USA, what they always say is that there are 30,000 gun deaths a year. What they neglect to mention is that 19,000 of those are individual suicides. Right. You don't want those to happen, of course. But in my opinion, some of those are almost reasonably honorable. They're people with unpayable debts. They're people trying to leave an inheritance to their family. They're people that have failed in their profession. That, to me, is their business. I'll say that openly. Yeah. So you've got 11,000 gun murders. Of those, 82%, if you talk to any competent LEO source, are gang-related. Majority of those are Black and Hispanic males. So the number of citizens that actually kill other citizens in a gunfight is minuscule. Um, if you look at the number of murders of, say, middle-class white women, 
if you look at the FBI data and then you br- try to break that down by the economic status of different regions of the country, yes. that's literally in the hundreds, not the thousands. So 82 percent of the gun murders that do exist are to some extent gangbangers killing each other. And the gang scene in the USA today is about 80 to 90 percent black and Latino, Hispanic. So this is actually very important. This is this should have been one of the taboos. If you look at the actual data on crime, you see that the conversation we're having on crime is almost irrelevant. This is point, I guess point one is so not genetic. Point two is actual data on crime completely challenges the contemporary upper middle class conversation that we're having. So we talk a lot about mass shootings. Um, Using any real definition of a mass shooting, like more than three people killed by a somewhat accurate shooter, there are about nine mass shootings in a typical year. Right. If, if you go beyond mass shootings to semi-automatic weapons, because as you know, most of the audience probably knows, automatic weapons are basically illegal in the United States. If you go beyond mass shootings to semi-automatic assault rifles, rifles all in kill about 485 people in a typical year. That's less than knives, less than fists. Most gun violence, 80% of gun violence, is gangbangers shooting each other with cheap handguns that can be easily purchased. So the question is, how do you stop that? But talking about it requires getting into this taboo space where we say, okay, 54% of the murders involve black dudes, not even Hispanics, Italian Americans, whatever, they involve young black men. There are other concentrations of death, whites dramatically lead when it comes to suicide. But if we're focused on murder, how do we solve that problem in the black community, black community, black community? And people are very reluctant to have that conversation. Right. Yeah, I mean, and that's kind of why I was asking you, because I, I knew you would be able to to talk about it in a way that makes a lot more sense. Oh, uh, if you're actually asking for a solution, OK, I think we opened with one. Um, one thing that's very important to remember about crime uh-huh. is that crime is not committed by men or for that matter, by poor whites or blacks or something like that. Those are massive groups. Right. Crime is committed by a small number of individual criminals. Mm. And we started this program by talking about uh, someone, you know, a casual friend actually has a program where in a mid-sized city like Sacramento, they identified the top 25 criminal offenders or possible criminal offenders during a period where they don't have to pursue them, say a period of probation. And they do something like offer them a job, possibly in the security field. And that dramatically reduces crime. I think that's a solution to this almost everywhere to some extent. Even in a city as big as Chicago, I would bet that if you identified the top 1,000 young male fighters, which might be 600 African-American men, 200 ethnic white men, 200 Hispanic men, and you were able to offer those guys something like, whether it's a forced military career, a la the Foreign Legion, whether all that would cause some problems for the military, um, whether that is civilian conservation corps type real work, whether that's something in the security field, If you took those thousand guys off the streets, theoretically, the same thing would happen if you just killed them. But I don't recommend that. You'd see a dramatic (laughs) drop in crime. You'd see crime drop by 40 to 50 percent from the reviews I've read of this. So that is the solution to some extent. You identify where crime actually is happening. And an incredibly disproportionate percentage of blue collar crime happens among white, poor white and black men under 30, lower class in urban areas. I mean, you can predict who's very likely to commit crimes. If you identify those people and offer them something else, you get less crime. The question is how to do that. Both left and right oppose that, by the way. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Both left and right oppose that, by the way. Yeah. Well, you know, we don't want to actually solve problems. (laughs) So there's probably a horrible truth to that if you're talking about, you know, the no term limits era in Congress. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I don't know that term limits would solve it either. Then you'd have a bunch of people scrambling, trying to get their job on K Street. Didn't we talk about this last time? If we eliminated K Street, there would just be a J Street. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, the other thing that's interesting about this, and, and you talked a number of times in the book. And, the, and the, seriously, so the book is called Taboo. And by the time this show comes out, it, it should be out. 
And it's fantastic. It will make you think. It will make you go, God dang it, I'm wrong again. Like a lot. And, and I pride myself in knowing a lot about social issues. And Will kept just nailing me with facts, actual facts from an actual PhD who has an actual license to to tell me these things. Well, thanks, man. Yeah, no problem. So so if not DNA, and, and I, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit because we're using a definition that I'm proposing, but it's an academic one. Then it's culture, right? Anything not defined by DNA is culture. Yeah. Culture's hard, yeah. hard to wrap your hands around, but fact, we use that definition. How much of this stuff, all of it, let me, let me back up and say this too. My time in combat zones has informed me that the specter is always significantly worse than the actual thing itself. Oh my gosh, there's Jay Shamadi. They're going to get me everywhere. And, and in reality, they're barely operating in that area at all. Could they come get you? Yes. On this one corner in this giant city of a million people, you know, is it going to be the end of your life? Yes. But for 999,999 other people, it's not. And it's just a, it's a place where you can go get dim sum if you feel like it. Or Ethiopian. You know, you, you have all these options. So at what point... Is this a cultural problem, which makes it a super wiggly, multivariate, no reliable path out kind of problem? So there are two things there. First of all, I, I've never experienced a military level combat situation, but I, I like that point that nothing is as bad as you imagine it is. I've found that to be very true just living my own life, mm. whether that's traveling to the developing world or just living in a lot of the places I've lived in. Yeah. Because I'm not really a gated community sort of dude. I mean, I've lived in the hood a bunch of times because a dog and a gun are cheap as versus a McMansion. <laughs> and I mean, living in Chicago, for example, you frequently hear comments like the South Side. Isn't there gunfire there every day? I hear that's more dangerous than Iraq, which is, of course, ridiculous. You have different population sizes. The reality is that if you live in a working class black or Italian neighborhood in Chicago, there might be one or two murders a year, which is a very high murder rate for an area that size, but which means you have a one in 40,000 chance of being killed. Right. Um, when I moved to Kentucky, ironically, all of my black buddies said, well, you're moving to central Appalachia. Isn't that one of the most dangerous areas in the country? And it's the exact same thing. Whether you're going overseas independently, whether you're thinking of joining the army, for that matter, although this is on kind of the more softer white collar level, if you want to go to law school or medical school, the worst story you've ever heard about it isn't going to be every day. It's just something to be aware of. Yeah. You move to the south side, it might help you to have a pistol and a Rottweiler, but you're probably not going to use them. At any rate, and your experience, of course, much more intense, but same principle. So I think it's good to say that all the time. We encourage cowardice in this country to an incredible degree. People are scared to walk through civilian areas in the country. That's generally ridiculous. Anyway, um, as to the second point, yeah, I think culture obviously is the cause of most non-genetic issues. And right now in the USA, I think we're in the midst of an interesting debate that's a waste of time. And I say this debate occurs between two groups, Al Sharptonites and Richard Jensenites. Okay. So Al Sharptonites are people that attribute all problems in the black community to racism. No matter what, you know, low SAT scores, that's that racism. That's the white man's math. Um, Richard Jensenites, this is a lot of the alt-right, really reify IQ and attribute almost everything to IQ. Higher rate of TV watching, that's IQ. This often, in my opinion, almost approaches pseudoscience. I mean, there are writers that will try to take the R and K reproductive strategies used by fish and attribute them to humans to explain why poor people have more kids. Yeah. I think there's a much simpler explanation than racism. And okay. I think there's a much simpler explanation than genetics, whether or not there are some 2 and 3% group differences. And yeah, that's cultural. And I don't think you have to come up with a ton of variables to explain why blacks or working poor whites or whatever do more poorly than you know, Chinese immigrants. The most notable difference is fatherlessness. So, I mean, in America right now, the quote unquote illegitimacy rate for the black community, you might correct this by a point or two, but I think it's 74%. 70 Hispanic, what? 74%. Get out of here. Wow. Okay. Google it. Wow. I mean, it's no, literally the black illegitimacy rate. I know it's over 70. I know it's over 70. Wow. Um, and by the way, whites aren't that far off. If you take all whites, including white Hispanics, I think it's 37% on the only 2018 data I've seen so far. Uh, Hispanics, 56. Natives, I know they're over 60. So when you look at why black communities or poor white communities have a lot of these issues, 
the most obvious answer is the absence of fathers. Yeah. I remember I was talking with a black buddy of mine, middle class black buddy, about Little League in one of the neighborhoods we used to live in. And he said, well, there's not a lot of Little League. The kids don't play baseball. And I said, well, why don't they play baseball? You know, don't play basketball one day, just pick up some bats. And he said, well, with who? Referring to the total absence of fathers, uncles that were really in the scene, even big brothers that are out that are not in jail, for example, or at work. And that's a valid point. And that's why yeah. poor Americans struggle. You can't get through a 74 percent illegitimacy rate. So, yeah, I think it's primarily cultural, almost entirely cultural. If you take a look at almost anything, well, I'll simplify this into one sentence. John McWhorter, qualitative writer, but good one. He's on The Black Guys on Blogging Heads TV. In a book called Losing the Race, once said that there seemed to be four things that if you adjust for, close the black-white IQ and crime gap. Those were father in the home, number of hours of TV watched every day, the grades demanded by your parents, and the number of books in your house. And those are almost entirely cultural variables, except for books. None of them has anything to do with IQ in the PhD sense. They're things that you can teach your kids. Anyone can slap their kid on the head and say, work harder in class. The question is, who does? Yeah. Asians. <laughs> There's an answer. Like, well, And also, uh, was it what, what country in Africa was just shocking in their uh, standout nature and their genius levels? Nigeria. Nigeria. Yeah. I want to get into that in a second. Uh, one of the things I've, I've I, so have, I don't know if you're familiar with Judith, Judith Rich Harris's book, The Nurture Assumption, Why Children no, Turn no, Out no. the Way They Do. Have you heard about this? I, I'm very familiar with the nature nurture debate and also with the fact that although nurture does have an impact, it's not what has traditionally been thought. It's friend group. It's public libraries. It's not really your parents as long as they don't abuse you. Um, but I haven't read this particular book. No, it, it, it is. What? It is the book. It is the one that started what you just said, all of that stuff where, yes, you can fuck your kid up. But if you think you can mold your kid into something that's reputable, reputable, well, then do it within your own family group and do it four times with your four kids. And you'll instantly see the problem. <laughs> like they, they, mm. You know, you love them, you care for them. But there are so many other factors by the time you wash all that stuff out that they ain't no room left for mom and dad, you know, but you can abandon your kid. You can't, yeah. you know, be so drug addled that they aren't raised properly. You can definitely fuck them up. Um, when we put kids in that kind of an environment, you know, and, and the cultural part is really left up to their own devices. There is no guide to kind of teach norms and mores and those kind of things. Are we, are we, post norm you know like all like all of this stuff with the transgender and no. all of these and you're trying to bring that part of the conversation in because i know you talk a little bit about it are we so internally meta focused that we are losing touch with what is okay day to day in society no i don't think so yeah. i think that there's a tendency among both the rich and the poor to shit on the petite bourgeois uh-huh um, I grew up in a poor neighborhood. I mean, East Aurora in the 1990s, you know, inner city Chicago at that time. I mean, these were globally known violent areas and people would mock mainstream suburbanites as basically prey. Um, there's not any other way to describe it. They can't defend themselves. They're not good in bed. They can't dance. They're the things we hunt. Um, and I've seen that same attitude among the rich. Um, I've seen it interestingly also among soldiers describing civilians, but there there's a sheepdog element to it as opposed to wolf. Yeah. It's like we've got to protect the poor, useless woolies, not like we'll just tear them apart. <laughs> but I mean, I think there's a tendency to mock bourgeois norms like, no, not in my mouth um, among rich people and poor people. Yeah. And I think that right now we're in the midst of a cultural climate where upper middle class predatory people are glorifying the behavior of lower middle class predatory people. But I think that in general, norms do survive among most people. The marriage rate in the American middle class is still very high. And I also think that norms survive among the people on the left who are saying they shouldn't. This is one of those things huh. that's absolutely stunning if you look at the data. Yeah. The percentage of people that go to the most left-wing, flamboyant schools, Berkeley, Brown, that go on to get married to a reasonably stable heterosexual monogamous person is astonishingly high. It's over 90% every time I've seen the data break it out. 
So I think that most people, most successful Americans understand that there are things, completing high school, completing college, getting a job and working it until you get a career, so on, that are going to produce success. Mm. Um, I think that what you have is a weird kind of cultural cancer where people that know this are telling people that don't necessarily know it that it's not true. And I think that's very problematic. I don't think that there are too many upper middle class brown graduates that are sending their three year old unsupervised to drag queen story hour. Right. Um, I don't, that's not a thing that occurs. But I do think that we have a less serious problem than what you described, but still a serious one, which is the promotion of total immorality by people that don't believe it. Right. This actually, I tend to ramble, so last comment for me on this one. But I mean, <laughs> I noticed that when I went to an urban public school, and I, I hadn't been sheltered. I mean, I knew how to you know fight and cook simple food and so on. But I, I hadn't really been exposed to the culture too much. My mom was good. My cousins were good. I was somewhat protected. When I first went to an urban public school, my one of my initial reactions I still remember was these people think it's cool to be evil. It was a very strong impression. Like huh. people think it's cool to cheat on their girlfriend. People think it's cool to not act like they like their parents. People are acting like they're much more sexual and violent than they are. Why? Hmm. And I do think that that is reflective of the fact that what you teach people through a venue like primetime television impacts how they behave. So we do need to look at the content that content creators are creating. Why this? Yeah, interesting. Okay, let me, and I want to I want to get away from the urban black violence thing here, but I do want to bring up this point because I was thinking about this while you were talking, uh, the point before. I've got this project I'm working on called The Prison Chronicles, and it's coming out really soon. Um, and it basically, yeah. it asks this question. If most murderers who are in prison get out of jail, what condition do you want them in when they walk out the door? And if I added a part B to this question, if I told you that they walk out with less than a thousand, most likely 200 ish dollars, would you be stoked for their chances of being a contributing member of society two years later? You know, like this is this is the premise. And so we talked to a guy who was convicted of murder and spent a lot of time in jail, well over a third of it in solitary confinement. And he said, think about me and my family growing up in Detroit. When you brought Detroit up, really, it's made me think of it. And the presence of PTSD, he talked about getting off the X. Everyone he knew in his family had been shot. His brother had shot his other brother. He had been shot himself. Everyone mm -hmm. he knew had been shot. And most everyone, if not everyone, it was going to or had already been in a correctional facility. So if... If PTSD affects me because I'm in combat and all this uncertainty and, and my cortisol pathways are all blown out because I'm always switched on, how is that not true for a bunch of black dudes? And, and then if I get special dis, you know, consideration in court, even though we pay a higher price when we get convicted, if I go through a special veterans court because, hey, this is a different case, is that something that we need to account for? You know, the, does the political scientist and you say, yeah, you know what, maybe – or, or is there a different path to this? Because it sure seems like an inequity to me that, that someone can experience all that trauma and we don't expect them to have, you know, significant problems making good choices and with anger. Well, I think that's an excellent question. I think there are different levels. First of all, I do think that being a combat soldier is something distinctive. I mean, I've had people shoot at me, basically discharge guns at places where I was. And I don't think I have PTSD. I mean, my understanding of the literature on this is that there, shell shock is a real concept. There is certain sustained hyper high level violence, howitzer or mortar on up shells coming at you for a consistent period of time that produces that always triggered effect. So I don't think that the average urban guy the black or otherwise would necessarily qualify as having PTSD. Then that's that's almost a personal sideline for me because I don't like the overdiagnosis of mental illness. Okay. Um, if I went to a modern psychologist and just told the truth, I would almost certainly be diagnosed as a clinical sociopath with ADD, OCD, mild PTSD, and a bunch of other crap, and I'd be given a bunch of zombie drugs for the rest of my life. Um, I think that this is bad, and I think it's true for most Americans. I don't think I'm crazy. Um, I think you, for that matter, I, I'm not a doctor, but yeah. I've definitely had some legitimately traumatizing experiences, but you still seem extremely high-functioning, whether or not medication might individually help someone with that. So, no, I don't think every guy in the hood has PTSD. I do think that, obviously, 
there's the old line, never do an enemy a small injury. Obviously, if we're not just going to kill people who commit serious crimes, which in many cases, rape, I would not have a problem with. If we're not going to do that, then yeah, we need to give these guys after some brutal early years when they're locked up, the rest of that time needs to be spent rehabbing them so they can be functional citizens. And right now we're in kind of a gray area where we don't just have the hangman's noose anymore, which had a 100% success rate, but we also don't have Swedish style rehab programs and so on. Jail's basically just gladiator school. Yeah. If you throw someone into anything but the best run prisons and virtually all the local county jails, they're going to be people trying to fight you, people trying to buy or steal your food, people sitting on the bottom of the bunk shirtless playing cards. It's not going to be an environment that prepares you for anything beyond going back to jail. So, yeah, just basic things like mandating that prisoners have to be paid a dollar for every hour they work, for example. It's currently about 20 cents mm -hmm. mandating that they get paid a buck and half of that goes into savings would do an incredible amount of good for these guys. You'd get out with $14,000, not 200. Right. They don't even give you a suit anymore. When you get out of prison, <laughs> I've taken, I went through a phase in my life where I took Amtrak trains across the country to see girls that I dated Atta to boy. see buddies, to travel. And a lot of the people on the trains are people that just gotten out of prison, which is funny. I mean, it wasn't a threat to me, but it's certainly like Mormon women and so on weren't too excited about it. But they give you a pair of cloth thin gray sweatpants. They give you a white T-shirt. They give you a surprisingly nice pair of Nikes and they put you on a bus. They give you enough money to get to your home destination. But they don't always give you two tickets. Sometimes you have to buy one at the bus stations. If you spend some of that money, you're just at the bus station. Like, yes, of course, you're doing that. You are making it more difficult for people to succeed. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, you know, and, and is that what we want as a society? You know, it's a, it's a hard question and a different show. L let's stay on the taboo topic. So yeah. let's talk a little bit more specifically about IQ. We've kind of kicked it around a little bit, but yeah. IQ tests, the IQ gap, and you're saying that once you account for three-ish to four-ish variables, that gap is reliably gone. And, and what about the whole thought of anybody below, say, an 85 IQ is, you know, basically a functioning idiot? And I mean the uh, technical definition of idiot, not the put down. <laughs> I, I, think there's a I think there's a difference between IQ and tested IQ. Okay. So for me, first of all, I would analogize IQ to physical fitness, not to height. So growing up in the hood, I had a tested IQ of 108. When I went to an elite law school, I had a tested IQ of 167. Now, my tested IQ is about 143. I'm still competitive, but it's not like U of I law, section C, study prep every day. I consider myself a geek in some ways, but when I'm home, I watch ESPN or Cook. I don't take IQ tests, oh. which is something we did for practice in law school. So, I mean, that that's notable. The, the gap between my lowest and highest IQ is 59 points, um, which is itself most of a human IQ. So again, when someone tests on a standard IQ board, unless you're doing the full culture fair five hours with the blocks, I think what you're looking at at a given time is how aware they are of functional post high school American culture, not really what their potential intelligence is. Uh, someone once told me, this was a buddy from I think Indonesia, uh, and he did very poorly on an American IQ test because of struggles with the language. But in his home country, it was about a 140. What he told me was that you have to understand Tarzan or Mowgli, the legendary, you know, semi-historical yeah. figures, would have gotten a zero on one of these tests just because they didn't speak colloquial written English. Right. Um, so all that is the preset. That said, I think IQ testing is very useful. It says how well qualified you are for normal, again, middle class life in a modern society. We're not going to stop using the tests. The SAT and the ACT are also almost pure IQ tests. You can almost put 100 in front of your ACT score and get something quite close to your IQ. So when you talk about the IQ gap, oh, that's probably more grad student mythology than anything else, but I'm sure there's a very close correlation between yeah. ACT and you know IQ, 90% correlation between SAT and IQ, I know. But anyway, when you talk about the IQ gap, right now there are IQ gaps between the major ethnic groups. This is not controversial. If you look at the latest writing about this by the audacious Epigon, for example, who, by the way, is on the far, almost dissident right. Um, so this is not a leftist arguing that we're doing extremely well, but the black IQ has risen to about 93. 
Um, there's a paper, Dickens and Flynn, 2006, that breaks down exactly right. what the black IQs are for each age cohort. So we're at, let's say, 92, 93. Whites are at 99. Asians seem to be at about 102. Uh, natives are a little under blacks. Hispanics are right around a little over blacks. So it is undisputed that these IQ gaps exist. The question is why they do. And the big thing on the alt-right is the claim that this is purely genetic. I find that really, really unlikely. Hmm. And a big part of that is that I'm a Tom Soul kind of center-right business conservative. I've read all Soul's books and all the responses to him. And I mean, if you look at history, it's extremely common that IQs for large populations jump by 15 or 20 points when you adjust for a simple variable like the one I just used, fatherlessness. So in Race and Culture, page 160, this isn't very controversial, Soul breaks down how different ethnic groups did on the Army Alpha basic tests that were used in World War I and World War II and the civilian equivalents. And as I recall, Italians, Irishmen, Greeks, Slovenes, the Portuguese, Serbs, so on down the line, got under an 85. All these groups tested at the same level as or below African Americans. Now all these groups test at the national normal. They're all between 97 and 102. And blacks themselves have increased their IQs by 8 to 10 points. So to me, there's a winning culturalist argument for IQ. It's just obvious that if you go to third world countries in Eastern Europe or Africa, people aren't going to do as well on a math test as they will in Los Angeles. Um, as with a lot of other things, from height to penis size to running speed, there might be some 3 or 4% group differences. But obviously, the amount of time you spend with books really predicts how you're going to do on most tests. Uh, again, the issue in black community is there's less of a focus on education. Generally, there are fewer fathers, so on down the line. Black immigrants do very well. Uh, of course. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, see, <laughs> just when you think you have your hands wrapped around something, you get that thrown at you, you know? <laughs> this well, makes me rub my head. Black immigrants, better for Robin. Yeah, black immigrants across the board. I mean, that's a big population. That's pretty diverse, too. Does that include Negritos from Filipinos? You know, that kind of thing? Or what? I think that and this, that's a great question in terms of like, what do these words even mean? Yes. If someone says black or a Asian is Asian's the one that does this for me. Oh, my God. If someone says, well, some Asians underperform whites and other Asians smoke everybody. The first response I have is, well, the, a lot of those Asians are different races. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about like black drop-ins from India versus people from Japan. You know, Asia is a very big place. Right. Yeah. You know, it's the other half of the world except for Africa. So, I mean, anyway, <laughs> um, large. But no, by black, I mean, I guess more than 50 percent Bantu or Ethiopic African. Like there really are definitions for the races. OK. We really do know what East and West African black people are. Right. So the whole idea that race is a cultural construct is pretty silly. Yeah. If you took an actual Ethiopian or Nigerian lord and told him he was white, he would laugh himself silly. It's that's something that goes on in our academia, not in real life. But I mean, black immigrants in general, and we don't have a very selective immigration system by any means. So that this that's not the reason for it. Uh, whether you're talking about West Indians, Nigerians, Ghanaians, they do extremely well. Nigerians are the group in the USA most likely to have PhDs. And this holds true for their children. There's no quote unquote regression to the mean. So again, I think what we see is that if you take reasonably selected people, good enough to get through a basic immigration process, and you maintain basically stable variables like a father, and you look at something like IQ scores or rates of criminal offending, they're going to be very similar. Um, that, that's my basic point on race. If someone took some technical issue and said, well, aren't whites better swimmers? They evolve near water. They hold all the swimming records. Maybe. But I mean, if you look at broadly who's going to make a varsity football team it's going to be a pretty diverse range of guys you know and that, okay. that that's my general take on race like, yeah i think when you get so let me ask you this question real quick too not to pin you on something but is no. iq heritable yeah of course okay. i mean it's the so all of this is kind of okay first of all again <laughs> sorry man <laughs> tarzan if you look at the mythological series of books tarzan Right. which was based to some extent on real humans raised by apes and wolves and so on. Tarzan, the character, is Lord Greystroke from England. So I'm not saying Tarzan, obviously, is a real person who's taking IQ tests. Right. But if you took the Greystroke gins, that family, average IQ probably 125, 
That's typical for upper class Brits. Tarzans would be zero because Tarzan was raised by apes. I think this Tarzan analogy is a good one that I sometimes use in classes. So IQ is obviously not a hundred percent heritable. Right, of course. What you find is that if you take people and raise them under what I believe was Jensen called any reasonable circumstances, I don't agree with some of his conclusions about race, but a good scholar in this field. Under any reasonable circumstances, IQ is about 60 to 70% heritable. That is, if my baseline IQ is 140, and you took me and you raised me in any situation from a peasant field to the Rajah's Palace in Jaipur, my IQ would be between 0.6 of 140 and maybe like 1.05 of 140. That's, that's what IQ is. The response to that, though, is that 40% is larger than any IQ gap that exists among humans today. Right. I.e., if you take an American white at 100 and an American black at 92, that's an 8% gap. Could an 8% gap be due to cultural variables? Yeah. I would, in fact, predict that if you take just black people with fathers in the house, you've got an average IQ of about 97. That might be one of my next papers. It hasn't been done as far as I can tell. So, I mean, again, race is real. It's just silly to say Kenyans aren't good distance runners or something like that. Right. Uh, it's a little more complex than we tend to think. If you talk to an organization like 23andMe, it's not that there exist Caucasians and then all blacks and then Easterners or something. There are about 50 different fractal regional populations that combine into seven large ones, Amerinds and so on down the line. Um, but race at that level is real. There probably are some small to moderate differences between racial groups. But I don't think that in the same society, IQ seems to be one of them to a massive extent. Mm. Uh, if you look at Britain's data right now, they, I mean, they have some violence, but they're pretty uh, race. The population's 10 percent black and Asian, reasonably assimilated by our standards. And I think their average IQs, as I recall, for Asians, 102 um, people who are multiracial, white and black, 99. I mean, so you just when you see these huge gaps between America and either Chechnya or Rwanda, you need to adjust for what's going on in Chechnya or Rwanda before you can really make a fair comparison. But yeah. Yes, IQ itself is heavily heritable, 60% plus, yeah. And, and, these, like, and, and talk about a uh, taboo topic, just to, just to say that, you know, and it's almost like you're bound to be in Flynn's camp or in Murray's camp. And, and, and either way, you're a horrible, evil asshole, Nazi, you know, Jew hater or whatever it is. Like, <laughs> no, I'm just trying to have an academic conversation about something that we struggle to nail down, like, like defining culture. Go ask 100 people and you'll get 300 definitions, you know. Um, uh, let's get back into the race part of this thing because you're bringing up some some fantastic points. I mean, uh, Asia, there's people in Oman that are Asian. There are mm -hmm. black dudes who will look at you in the face and say, I am white, who are Asians in Turkey. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... Uh, <laughs> Dude, race is crazy. When people say all white people, you know, you, I don't know, you and I've discussed this in the past, but, but what the fuck is white people, you know? Well, it, this again, oh, yeah. sorry, go on. No, no, no. Well, I was just going to bring in how, like, uh, by the way, you know, those, those, I'm going to say Arabs because I'm not going to be too specific because that's the whole point. Um, Arabs are white. Jesus was white. Uh, Jews and, and a lot of Arabs, you know, at least the Middle Eastern Arabs, they're the same people, you know, yeah. racially. So let's understand that what we understand about race colloquially, colloquially uh, is not all that crystal clear. This is one of the bit, and I don't want to keep going back to debates I've had a couple of years ago. So in fact, I'll stop doing that and just make this one sentence. This is another big problem with kind of the dissident right. Um, race is different from ethnicity, one, and being white is different from being Caucasian, two. Right. So from what I've learned from 23andMe, there are, in addition to unassigned, which just means highly mixed, there are about six human racial populations. One is European Caucasian. One is West Asian Caucasian, which is Arabs and such, which is virtually identical to European Caucasian. One is East Asian and Native American. One is Bantu Black, West African Black. I think another one is North African and East African Black. That's a little different, Somali and so on. Um, and I honestly forget what the other one would be. I don't want to make it up, but anyway, there, so there are specific racial populations. Um, and you can find these just by Googling 23andMe regional groups or 23andMe source groups. 
So in fact, I don't think most scholars are too confused as to what race is. I think most people could look at, say, an Afghan and say, well, that's a West Asian Caucasian if they recognize race at all. There is some dispute around that because of past interbreeding. Um, I think that the issues that are in conflict come up when people start trying to create racial identities that don't match the real ones. Uh -huh. so the idea of white in America basically means Northern European non-Muslim Caucasian. Yeah. The problem with this is that there's no difference between Northern European non-Muslim Caucasians and Northern European Muslim Caucasians, like Chechens. There's not much difference between Northern European and Southern European Caucasians. All of these groups, and this is an estimate, but vary by maybe two or three percent in terms of even those differences that do vary with race. So, I mean, in a sentence, if you are arguing for white supremacy, what you would have to show is that Caucasians overall do better than kind of the other major serious racial groups like West African blacks or Asians. And that's very difficult to do because the actual Caucasian group includes the Middle East. So it includes the most violent Arab and Persian countries, Iraq, Iran, Palestine, all those people are 100% genetically Caucasian to the point where you said Jesus was white. And I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that. I mean, it's all Caucasians. Right. Um, that includes what I might glibly think of as Borat's country. Uh -huh. I mean, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, all that. Tajikistan has some Asians. But all those countries, 90 plus percent haplotypically Caucasian. Eastern Europe, so you're talking about Albania, Bosnia, Serbia, Kosovo, Montenegro, all those countries, Caucasian. So if you look at all of the Caucasians, you don't necessarily see global stellar performance. You know, wonderful people, just as we all are, but no one's going to take a summer vacation in Palestine. Right. So you can't just separate the successful Caucasians economically from the other Caucasians and say, well, this is a different group. I mean, it would be very easy for blacks to do the same thing. I mean, I could point to all the tropical paradises in the world. I mean, Bermuda, Bahamas, Barbados, Botswana, Brazil will give you that's about 50 percent black. You know, so on down the line and say, well, these are, you know, St. Kitts and Nevis, average income 40,000 per a year. I could say, well, these are the real black people. Those, those people in Africa, those are Negroes. We don't claim them. <laughs> they would be the same kind of meaningless statement as me saying, well, Germany's wonderful, so white power. All someone has to say is, what about Albania, Haas? <laughs> you know, so in general, some mild racial differences probably do we see massive gaps among people of different races in the same society? Not usually, no. But I mean, one thing that's interesting about this also, you said whether you're in Murray's camp or Flynn's camp, you're going to be called a Nazi. And that's correct. Yeah. If you recognize that IQ exists at all in modern science, you're seen as saying something very radical. So when I say there's an eight or nine point black white IQ gap, but calm down, that's cultural. People will then very often attack me and say, are you saying black culture is inadequate? You Uncle Tom monster. <laughs> and at some point you have to be able to say, look, it's good to have a dad. Yeah. You know, it's not ideal that half of blacks or poor whites or whatever don't have fathers. Seventy percent of us. That's not good. So, I mean, it, but even that is becoming increasingly contested in the same way that the statement men aren't women is becoming increasingly contested. Yeah. Yeah. Good grief. The gender thing. Is it possible that 10 years from now, we're going to find out that gender is not simply tied to an XY chromosome value and that there, there is a, I mean, I think there's, there's doctors at Stanford that are working on this very thing and understanding, you know, what does create a gender identity goes beyond just that thing. Is, is that, is that irrational to think that we're going to slide off of XY and that's it? I mean, cause we already know there's XX, there's XXX, there's XXY uh, chromosome combinations. Granted, they're exceptionally rare, but those exist. Well, I think all those people are intersex. I mean, right. it's very predictable. Like, I can tell you what an XXY person would look like. Right. In terms of there'd be some feminine characteristics, but this is the problem. I mean, like, it, those are intersex individuals. Okay. I think in general, they're two different things. One, gender may well be a matter of personal self-definition. Sex isn't. Okay. So it's very easy to define a female as a person, I may not be exactly right about what a 3XY would look like. I encourage people to look that up on their own. But it's very easy to define a female as a person with an all X chromosomal order. Let's say a non-intersex person with an all X chromosomal order. That's all the females. That's removed all the non-XX or XX plus. Yeah. Non-intersex person with an all XX chromosomal order 
that in 99.9997% of cases manifests itself in a self-lubricating vagina, lactating breast. I mean, you want to be PG here, but that's what a woman is. Uh, Similarly, for a male, a person with an XY or XYY chromosomal order that in 99% of cases manifests itself in a penis and external testicles, 100% of males have an extended hyoid bone, anally occluded prostate. I mean, we're getting extremely wonky here, but we know what sex is. The question really, the question is, is there something called gender that's different from sex? Right. That's an, that is an interesting question. But even if you say yes, and I might say yes, that if you, I've seen people in essentially drag outfits in unexpected situations, i.e. overseas or on the south side of Chicago, and it takes a while to process what sex they actually are because of a variety of cultural cues. It's not hard in some societies, as you've probably seen, for women to imitate men in terms of dress. So is someone who has a brain more typical of the opposite sex, who is putting on the clothing and accoutrement of the opposite sex, who is homosexual, and who wants to be seen as a member of the opposite sex, is it fair to say that their gender is a little different from their sex? I don't really have a huge problem with that, frankly. I mean, going back to Rome, they called this uh, the effeminate movement or the two-souled movement. Natives use that same term, two-spirit. So I don't have a problem with that. The issue with that, though, is that it doesn't change your sex at all. This has to be understood. So if you are fully transgender, i.e. you want to be seen as a woman, you dress as a woman, you look like a woman because of cultural cues, but you have a 10-inch penis, I'd be really question, I'd really question you playing girls' varsity sports. I mean, is that going to be the best thing if you decide you want to hook up in the locker room? Is that going to be the best thing, for that matter, out on the court when you're dominating 5'4", female, small forwards? No. Because biologically, you're a man. There are certain things that just kind of suck. If you have the mental condition of gender dysphoria and you believe that you are, and that's what transgenderism is. It's a recognized mild mental illness. There's no dispute about this in science, really. If you have this mental condition and you honorably believe yourself to be a woman, but you're a man biologically, that's going to cause you a lot of problems, but we can't necessarily treat you by saying you're a biological woman. Yeah. And, and uh, the whole sports thing is, boy, that's just, you know, it is, I don't want men knocking out women, not, not because of uh, some kind of violence thing, but just, it's not an even fight. That's why we don't let, you know, 125 pound guys fight against 225 pound guys. There's, there's a difference in how they're built and their ability to apply force. Um, is there any other taboo you want to cover real quick? I mean, I, I know we've been through sort of a, a survey of a lot of them, but I want to make sure I give you a chance to expand on any of them that we haven't covered. Well, so we've talked about race and IQ. That's one of the chapters. Um, we've talked about uh, Black Lives Matter. That's one of the chapters. I guess one of the other chapters that comes to my mind, there's one chapter where I say whiteness isn't the only privilege and cultural appropriation isn't even real. I think that's fairly important. Yeah, I'll try to restrain my natural urge to babble. But essentially, if you take any competently done survey of privilege, you have 100 questions that go from, you know, do you know what frequent flyer miles are to have you ever been beaten up by more than two people? And you go down through all these items, summer job. If you administer that to people, you find that with everything else adjusted for, whites do about three points better than blacks. So there is white privilege in the sense that if you take two identical guys, University of Michigan, 2.8 GPA, 510, and you send them out to apply for jobs, the white guy's going to do a little better. Um, But what you find if you look at something like this is that a ton of things matter way more than race. Uh, About 60% of privilege is just social class. Mm. So how well off you and your parents are is the huge majority predictor of how easy your life's going to be. We find uh, people that have done this, including me, um, although not yet in the final version of the survey, But people that have done this find that being gay has more of a negative impact on your life than being black. Hmm. Being fat has more of a negative impact on your life than being a member of any race who's fit. So does being extremely short for men, birth order. I mean, so you can go through all this stuff. Basically, white privilege is a univariate idea. All you're saying is that whites have an advantage over blacks. That's true overall on average. It's not true for most individuals. When you encounter a particular guy, you have no idea whether his father just died of cancer. Right. So that's white privilege. Cultural appropriation is just a dumbass idea. Yeah. I don't see how anyone could take this seriously. The basic idea is just that you should not do things 
that were invented by a group you once oppressed or warred with. But that's everything. Yeah. I mean, that would include us Westerners eating sushi. Japanese businessmen would have to trade their suits in for kimonos and swords. I mean, this sounds kind of ridiculous, but it is accurate. The numerals we use, we borrowed from the Arabs. We fight the Arabs every five years. I mean, so the idea they would have to give up cars, which Westerners invented, um, go back to ships of the desert. So the basic idea that you can't do something an enemy once did is ridiculous. That's kind of one of the closing lines that I plan to use from the book in interviews. But I, I've got all told about 10 of these chapters. One is that the alt-right doesn't have much to offer either. Kind of striking back at that griper hard right movement that's growing on the right. You know, I've got a chapter about immigration where the taboo is we don't have to take immigrants. We should take in only people that are sane, non-criminal, reasonably able-bodied and healthy, um, and able to pass basic IQ boards. That chapter got the most resistance from people that read it. So there are a few of them, but I would close with, you can learn anything from anyone. Yeah. No cultural appropriation, no special white privilege. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and I, I think that what you're talking about in terms of immigration, and, and I've been saying this for a while, not that I'm the smartest guy in the world, but uh, if Congress has a problem with immigration, then Congress has a Congress problem. You know, this is this is their job to fix. And I agree with you. I, look, my my favorite American is the next one. I want people to come here. I love that they give up their homeland and come here to be part of what we're doing. I think it's the best thing ever. I also don't mind having a wall and saying anybody who wants to come in, we'd like to know who you are. Make sure you're healthy. You know, maybe run a background check. And if you are a criminal, hey, let's figure out how to get you into a system so we can make sure you do well, you know, because I'll tell you what, um, Jack Barsky was an embedded agent from the KGB living in the Americas. He, the the yeah. series Americans, he advises on that thing. And he made so much money as a computer software guy. He, he's like, fuck being a spy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be an American. So here's a guy that's supposed that's to, you know, the guy that, that opened up World War II for us with Japan, that guy ended up going, you know what? I don't hate America. I love it. I'm going to raise my kids there. So mm -hmm. I'm all for that. But I also understand saying, let's understand who you are, what we're getting, and then also allowing us to say, you know what? No, thanks. You got to go somewhere else. I mean, that's That to me is reasonable. It's not racist. I, you know, we... We want immigration. We're all about it. But you have to have some control. Nobody just lets anybody into their house. You know, it's crazy. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, uh, what we've seen in recent years by the right to some extent, but more often by the left, is the redefinition of just common sense terms like racist. Right. I mean, in the current Democratic primary election, I've actually voted Democrat more often than Republican in my life. But I mean, people are saying things that strike me as just crazy. Uh, Julian Castro at one point just said, well, why don't we get rid of SS 3175? Mm -hmm. And if you look at that, that's the law that makes illegal immigration illegal, makes it criminal. It would be a ticketable civil violation if we got rid of that. Right. So there's now an open argument. Why don't we just open the borders? Because we are such a bad racist country. We shouldn't keep anyone out. We need to change ourselves overnight. And I think that's a crazy idea. I mean, obviously, yes, nations have a right to regulate who enters the country. Without borders, technically speaking, you don't have a country. So, yeah, we can decide who we want to have come in. We could put a total moratorium on immigration for 10 years. Yeah, That wouldn't be racist at all. It would block European communist cheese eaters. It would block our neighbors from south of the border. It would block people from the rising powers of Africa. It's a moratorium. Countries do that all the time. So we can do whatever we want in terms of our immigration policy. And that, that's a point I make. There's no real need to listen to the murmurings of a few fanatics as though they're gospel in any sense of that word. So, I mean, each chapter goes through one of these things. But, yeah, I totally agree. We need to vet who we let in the House. Uh, we don't necessarily do a great job of that. I mean, it's, a, it's an inspiring story that the spy you're describing decided he wanted to be an American – we probably should have a system that prevents spies from coming in and just spying for 20 years before they have a change of heart. Right. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And at least try to prevent that guy from doing it. And yeah, look, you've been, we've been talking for over an hour and it's just yeah. great. The book is fantastic. It's it talks about these taboo topics and, and will is, is, has written just a hell of a book. And, and there's a few jokes in there along the way, which I appreciated. And, uh, if it matters to you at all, um, 
you know, I read it. I read a lot of books during a year. This was one of my favorites. It's a book I've always wanted to read, and I'm glad that someone finally had the courage to write it. I, I think it's exact. I think it's great critique that people are breaking their brains on the immigration portion. It means you're doing exactly what you set out to do. You're bringing a taboo topic in. And, and again, you unseated me in, I don't know, a couple of dozen times where I'm like, God damn it. I don't know shit about shit, you know? And now I got to reassess who I am. And look, I, I, I always say all the time too, intolerance is a human, very like a natural thing. We're just intolerant mm-hmm. and, as a norm. And then the evolved person goes, hold on, you know, I need to actually create space for this. Doesn't mean that I like child molesters, but they exist. And, and we got to deal with them. You can't just say, I don't tolerate them. Well, good. That doesn't do anything. You know, you have to deal with these things and have an evolved position. So anyhow, all that yammering on, I just want to thank you, man, for, for writing that book. I know it's, I know it's not easy and I'm sure you enjoyed it, but we need more books like this. We need to have more of these conversations so we can all calm the fuck down, act locally. You know, you, you want to change the whole goddamn government from the top. Why don't you just go get involved? Volunteer on that committee that has open seats and has every committee I know in small government has an at-large thing because they want you to participate, and that chair is always empty. So go get fucking involved if you want to change something. Read Will's book. You will learn something, and you will enjoy it. Will, any last words? Um, No, not really. Well, actually, I guess one. Uh, the thing you just said about local politics is something I always say. Um, people ask me, what can I do to get involved in terms of these ideas, saying center right, often political principles at the local level run for alderman, man. Yeah. I mean, it's extremely easy to get involved. And this is actually a problem in America. We've seen the collapse of that social fabric where most people used to play a varsity sport for their high school, then join the army, come home, go to church, join the Elks club, run for office. Now people do none of those things. We become isolated consumers. This doesn't have anything to do with race or class or whatever. It's something anyone can fix on their own. It's a you problem. So if you don't like the society, run for office and change it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this goes back to Kennedy. And it's hilarious that the left is so guilty of this now. But they're all asking what their country can do for them. And, and, you know, here's the icon saying that's wrong. You know, we've got to be in. If you don't like what's going on, get in, get to work. And guess what? That shit's hard. It sucks. And you have to cooperate with your neighbor who you don't know. And they disagree with you vehemently, but you have to do it if you want to make a difference. Then you all, all of a sudden you understand how hard it is to nudge the dial a little bit. Anyhow, I'm going to keep on yakking. Thanks so much for coming on, man. Have a happy holiday. And, and really, seriously, thank you so much. Always good talking to you, man. Have a good day, Pete.